But by now, even the prisons were unable to contain the guerrilla fighters. In September 1983, the largest escape ever from a British prison took place from Longkesh. Armed IRA volunteers took command of their prison block, then drove to freedom in the prison's food lorry. But it was in Brighton, England, in October 1984, that the IRA demonstrated its devastating capacity. The hotel housing delegates to the Tory party's annual conference was bombed. The British Prime Minister and her cabinet had a narrow escape. In their statement released afterwards, the IRA declared, we only have to be lucky once, you have to be lucky all the time. The British response was open coercion and terror. Suspected guerrilla fighters were now shot dead on sight. Loyalist killer gangs were rearmed, given intelligence on Republicans, and often led to their targets within the nationalist community. Even the burial of those killed became opportunities for the state to launch attacks. With their bare hands, the community fought back, determined that their volunteers be buried with the honours they deserved. The IRA also fought back. With homemade heavy mortars, they wreaked havoc upon British and RUC military installations. Mobile patrols came under sustained rocket and grenade assault. Foot patrols were attacked by snipers. In the sky, British forces were no longer safe. And in England, normal life was brought to a standstill. Motorways, train lines and airports were closed due to IRA bombs or the fear of bombs. Even number 10 Downing Street, home of the British Prime Minister, was no longer safe. The guerrilla war being fought on all fronts was costing the British dearly. In 1992, it amounted to 3.4 billion pounds. But when the IRA bombed the Baltic Exchange in the heart of London's financial centre, the cost was not just monetary. It shook the confidence of foreign investors. The business world was growing deeply uneasy about the war in Ireland. At home, Sinn Féin was going from success to success with every election. Oppression of the guerrilla forces had failed. The British government finally had to negotiate with them. To facilitate this, the IRA, from a position of strength and confidence, declared a cessation of all military actions from the 31st of August 1994. James Molyneux, Unionist Party leader at the time, described the IRA's move as the most destabilising thing to happen in Northern Ireland. Other political and community leaders praised the IRA for their courageous move. But the British Tory government of John Major was slow to respond, and securocrats in British intelligence and the RUC viewed it as an opportunity to step up attacks upon the nationalist community. On the 9th of February 1996, the IRA dramatically announced the end of its cessation with a massive bomb in the centre of London. Months later, they penetrated and bombed the headquarters of the British Army in the north of Ireland. The following year, May 1997, the Labour Party in Britain was elected in a landslide victory. Negotiations with the IRA were reopened and the cessation reinstated. 
All party talks quickly followed and led to the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in April 1998. One element of that agreement was the release of political prisoners, many of whom had not even been born when the guerrilla campaign first began. The Irish Republican community has come a long way. Today it is proud, confident and forward-looking, the result of over three decades of bitter and hard-fought struggle. Many ordinary men and women have contributed to that struggle inspired by the dedication, courage and commitment of the guerrilla fighters, the volunteers of Oglick na Heron, many of whom have given their lives for their people and for the Republic. Important elements have made the IRA the success they are. Their anti-colonial struggle is recognised at home and worldwide as legitimate. Despite all attempts by their enemies to do so, the guerrilla fighters have never been divided from the community on whose behalf they struggle. They are the men and women, fathers, mothers, brothers and sisters of that community. Many of their political leaders have once been active volunteers, others have been imprisoned. Most importantly, however, the IRA's success lies in its ability to be self-sufficient in the manufacturing of its own weapons and explosive devices. With that knowledge, they can never be disarmed.